So in this video I'm going to be talking about some Australian colonial history and I just want to talk about the experiences of some of the African convicts who were transported to Australia during the transportation period of 1788 to 1868. Um, in this video I'm going to discuss two specific individuals and their lives, not really a general overview of the African experience in colonial Australia. And I'll probably make a couple more videos on a few other people later on. And I'll just mention here that, just for some general background information, that there were 11 African convicts who arrived on the first fleet. And they were all convicted in Britain, but had initially been from America. And this is at least partly due to the American Independence War, when the British offered freedom to slaves who defected and fought or worked for the British. Mostly men had defected, but there were cases of women, children, entire families escaping and defecting to the British. So estimates of the black population in Britain at the time fluctuated from like 3,000 to 15,000 to 40,000. They typically lived in the most impoverished areas and near the river where casual work was sought or they survived as best they could. Um, the majority were located located in London in the 1780s, particularly the East End, and there was also a big population in Deptford. Additionally, a large number of black servants lived in Westminster and also a parish in the west of London, just based on um, records of baptisms for black adults. Um, also, many of the black inhabitants of Britain were also sailors, as well as the refugees who came from America or servants. The majority were also male, so there was a gender imbalance among the black community in Britain during this time. So many of them did marry white British women or Irish women, and due to these like interracial marriages that were occurring, it could su it could suggest that there was not much stigma attached, or at least there wasn't much stigma among the poor. Edward Long said that lower class women were remarkably fond of the black men. There was also an idea to send convicts to an area of West Africa and there was a shipload of them who were sent to the, there basically to protect Britain's slave interests in the region. But this turned out to be a major failure and a large number died and others, they just weren't controlled very well. They were getting drunk and causing a lot of issues. There were then plans to send uh, many of the African people in Britain um, to West Africa I believe it was on a voluntary basis, but I don't think it worked out. And yeah, the plans to send convicts to West Africa were then deserted for Australia. So if you want to know more about that, Cassandra Pybus does give more detail in her book, Black Founders. So I will provide a link um, to where you can get that book if you're interested. Also, later on during the convict transportation period, there were more African convicts who were, take, who were sent from like South Africa, Mauritius, the Caribbean, as well as Britain and the United States. I also just want to give this warning now before I begin that this video may contain the names or images of deceased Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people. So first I'll start with John Caesar, who was transported on the first flea and is cited as the first bushranger. That is a person who, you know, fled to the bush and took up arms, surviving by robbing people, kind of like a highwayman. So we don't know a lot about John Caesar prior to his transportation, but we do know that he was living in England in the parish of St. Paul Deptford in 1786. And he was probably a slave at some stage, as his name of Caesar suggests as much. And he would have been born sometime around 1763-64. Um, some sources say that John Caesar was from the West Indies and others from Madagascar. But there's not really like a definitive source that can say where he was from. Obviously, slaves are still being taken from Africa to the Americas during the 1700s. So it's totally possible that he was born in Africa. Um, but just as for Madagascar, when compared to West Africa, only a small proportion were taken from there. But in Thomas Keneally's book, Australians' Origins to Eureka, a quote by an unnamed person described him as a native of Madagascar. Also, as I mentioned in the beginning, during the American Independence War, the British did offer freedom to slaves who defected and worked for them. So he could have even been 
from the North American colonies and gained his freedom by joining the British. And Cassandra Pybus puts this forward as a suggestion as there were a number of adolescents named Caesar who are recorded as defecting to the British. But we really just don't know for sure. So in Britain, he was a servant and on the 13th of March of 1786, he was convicted and sentenced to transportation for stealing 12 pounds from a dwelling house in Kent. He was sentenced to seven years transportation, which was the common sentence. While awaiting transportation, he was incarcerated on the prison hulk Ceres. And for those who don't know, prison hulks were ships that were converted into jails because the English jails on land were severely overcrowded. And I won't go over all the background information of how the first fleet came to be and how it was organised because that could be a whole video itself. But Caesar was embarked on the Alexander on January 6, 1787, and it set sail for Australia in May of that year as part of the first fleet. During the voyage, there was, you know, a lot of fear and there were signs of scurvy on sand dysentery. The need for fresh food is obviously vital and they were only able to make three stops for provisions. A stop at Tenerife, Rio, and another at Cape Town. Cape Town was described as being somewhat an unwelcoming site with gallows, racks and spikes and dead bodies on display. Now, Caesar, during the voyage, became a servant to Captain James Maitland Sharp early on and an a number of officers took servants from among the convicts during the voyage and many also took convict women as their companions. Pybus suggests that Caesar might have even been pleased to be, to be able to leave the convict hold because um, it would have been cramped and unhygienic, especially to, due to seasickness and also Caesar was about six foot tall. So it might have been nice to get out of the convict hold, but we don't really know. <laughs> So the first fleet arrived at Botany Bay between the 16th and 20th of January of 1788, with different ships arriving on different days. They weren't very content with this area as they didn't think it would meet their needs, so the ships headed further north to what became known as Sydney. On the 26th of January, the British flag was planted and the colony of Sydney was declared. In Sydney, John Caesar gained a reputation as one of the hardest, toughest workers in the colony. In late April 1788, Caesar was charged with stealing rations, specifically four pounds of bread from the tent of another convict. Caesar denied this and claimed that the bread was given to him by Lieutenant Sharp. Sharp did give testimony, but the record for this case is now incomplete, so we don't know what um, Sharp said, whether Caesar was found guilty or not, and if he was found guilty, what the sentence was. If he was found guilty, it's possible he was sentenced to 100 to 300 lashes, as some other people were sentenced to this on the same day. Also, a 17-year-old convict was executed for stealing bread and his body was left hanging on display. According to one source, on the 29th of April 1789, he was found guilty of stealing tobacco with another African convict who was known as Black Jemmy. However, Cassandra Pybus asserts that they were in court for separate offences on the same day. The convict known as Black Jemmy was in court for stealing tobacco, whereas Caesar was there for another unspecified charge of theft. And he was sentenced to another term of transportation. This time it was for life. The other convict, Black Jemmy, was sentenced to receive 500 lashes. Just two weeks later, Caesar absconded into the bush with a gun he had stolen from a marine. Due to being unaccustomed to the region and having a limited knowledge of the land, he would have been... He would have found it difficult to sustain himself, and so he began stealing food. He stole from settlers, especially through nightly raids on gardens and also from Aboriginal camps. On May 26, he attempted to steal the rations of a convict brick-making gang, but was almost captured. He was then apprehended on June 6, 1789, when he broke into the house of Zachariah Clark, and another convict named William Saltmarsh was able to apprehend him. David Collins, the deputy judge advocate, stated, He was such a wretch and so indifferent about meeting death that he declared while in confinement that if he should be hanged, he would create a laugh before he was turned off by playing off some trick upon the executioner. John was sentenced to work in chains on Garden Island, where a garden had first been established for the crew of the HMS Sirius. Governor Philip allowed that John could take vegetables from the gardens as well as having his usual rations, perhaps understanding that his thefts were motivated by hunger. 
Collins again described him as incorrigibly stubborn. His frame was muscular and well calculated for hard labour, but in his intellects he did not very widely differ from a brute. His appetite was ravenous, for he could in any one day devour the full ration for two days. A few months later, on December 22, 1789, he was still on Garden Island, but then he stole a canoe and absconded with a gun after his chains had been removed. Again, he survived in the bush by robbing settlers and Aboriginal people of food. About six weeks later, John returned to the Rose Hill Colony after receiving several wounds from being speared. He had apparently lost his musket and therefore was unable to defend himself or subsist. According to the First Lieutenant on the HMS Sirius, William Bradley, even if Caesar did not have ammunition, he survived because when he saw a party of natives with anything on or about their fire, he frightened them away by coming suddenly on them, swaggering with his musket. And when he lost the musket, he found it impossible to subsist himself. He was then attacked by the natives and wounded in several places and escaped from a party of them through a very thick brush when he surrendered himself. He was sent to hospital to recover and on March 4th, Governor Phillips sent Caesar to Norfolk Island. And again, Collins commented, To gratify his appetite, he was compelled to steal from others. All his thefts were directed to that purpose. This is especially because at this time the colony was relying on the rations that were brought over from England and they were continuously being decreased to ensure that they lasted until more ships arrived with more rations. The colony was on the brink of starvation for some time. It's also worth pointing out that it was a capital offence to steal food at this time, so people could be and some were executed for it. In fact, six soldiers were executed for stealing from the government stores, and in November of 1789, a convict woman was executed for stealing. She was the first woman to be executed in the colony. But Caesar wasn't, and this could be because he was believed to be a very hard worker, and they might not have wanted to lose such a hard worker. On Norfolk Island, John Caesar appeared to do quite well. He was able to support himself and in July 1791 he was issued with a hog and in January 1792 he received one acre of land and was ordered to work three days a week. On March 4th 1792 he became a father when English convict and power or poor who arrived with the second fleet in 1790 gave birth to a daughter named Mary Ann. Ann had been convicted and initially sentenced to death for burglary but this was commuted to seven years' transportation. She was also convicted in Kent, like John was. They may have been married, but I haven't seen a record for this, but this could be because some marriages might not have been recorded or the records were lost over time. They might not have married either, but were just living together as a couple, which was actually quite common at the time. But unfortunately, about a year later, 1793, John Caesar was returned to the mainland, which meant he left behind his daughter and Anne Power. In the book Black Founders by Cassandra Pybus, it was also stated that Anne was pregnant at this time, as later baptismal records list a John Poor, born in 1793 on Norfolk Island. Back on the mainland in July 1794, John Caesar absconded again. Again, it was Collins who recorded... Caesar, still incorrigible, took up his former practice of subsisting in the woods by plundering the farms and huts at the outskirts of the towns. He was soon taken, but on his being punished, and that with some severity, he declared with exultation and contempt that all that would not make him better. The punishment mentioned here was a flogging, though I'm not aware of how many lashes he was sentenced to receive. Then in late 1795, he was with a work party in Botany Bay when they were attacked by Aboriginal warriors who were led by Pemulwuy. Pemulwuy was very well known in the colony and quite feared. Caesar wounded him, which likely added to his notoriety. He then escaped once more in December 1795, and on this occasion he was said to be leading a gang of other like-minded convicts. Collins said that, quote, every theft was com that was committed was ascribed to him, and settlers were warned not to supply him with ammunition, as he was likely gaining firearms and ammunition from sympathetic ex-convicts. On January 29, 1796, 
a reward of five gallons of spirits was offered for John Caesar's capture. Governor Hunter reporting, It is well known that a fellow known as Black Caesar has absented himself for some time past from his work and has carried with him a musket. A notice is hereby given that whoever shall secure this man, Black Caesar, and bring him in with his arms shall receive as a reward five gallons of spirits. According to Tom Gilling in the book Grog, A Bottled History of Australia's First Thirty Years, John Caesar had vowed never to come in nor suffer himself to be taken alive. A few weeks later, on February 15th, he was shot by John Wimbo at Liberty Plains, which I believe is now Strathfield. According to Collins, Wimbo and a companion found where Caesar was staying and they concealed themselves all night at the edge of a brush that they had seen him enter. Caesar came out in the morning and saw the two armed men and presented his musket, but Wimbo was quicker to pull the trigger and shot him. He was then carried to the hut of a Thomas Rose, where he then died a few hours later. George Barrington, who gained notoriety in Britain and Ireland for being a pickpocket and was sentenced to transportation, wrote, Thus the colony at length rescued from the depredations of a ruffian, whom no indulgence could reclaim nor severity intimidate. The mother of his child, Anne Power, also died less than two months after John, on March 25th. Their son and daughter may have been adopted by uh, a woman named Hannah Fisher, or Cassandra Pybus states that they were adopted by Mary Randall. Mary arrived on the Lady Juliana, like Anne, and she was living with John Blatherhorn, alias Fisher. Some sources say that their daughter was baptised in 1806 as Mary Ann Fisher Power or Poor and their son John was baptised as John Poor. They appear as passengers on the ship Lady Nelson in 1813. The two children had their mother's surname, which was apparently common for children on Norfolk Island to be listed by their mother's surname. But John, John does not appear in records afterwards and most sources don't actually mention that John Caesar had a son, just that he had a daughter. I also have not been able to locate records for Mary Ann. However, Cassandra Pybus stated in her book that Mary Ann had at least two daughters to an unknown man and she married twice before dying in the mid to late 1820s in Van Diemen's Land. This is also just a list of the 11 African convicts who arrived on the First Fleet. Some of these birth years are estimates and the unknown death years are because some of these men left the colony, so it's difficult to locate them in other parts of the world. For example, James Williams left the colony in 1792 and had actually attempted to escape twice before that. Thomas Orford applied to leave the colony in 1806 and John Coffin's time expired in 1795 when he also left Norfolk Island on a ship. So now I'm going to talk about John Goff. He was born about 1792 and his native place was recorded as the Isle of Wight, which is off the south coast of England. In his convict indent from about 1814 or 1815, he was described as having a black complexion, black eyes and black woolly hair and being about five foot five and a quarter. In a later record, he was also described as being quote-unquote mulatto, so he did likely have a white mother and a black father. As I mentioned previously, uh, the black population in Britain were mostly men during this time period, so they often married white British or Irish women. Um, Goff also worked as a sailor prior to his transportation. On the 19th of March 1814, he was sentenced to 14 years transportation at Exeter. He was held on the prison hulk Perseus, which was moored off the coast of Portsmouth. So from there, he could have been able to see the Isle of Wight where he had lived previously. On the prison hulk records, his offence is recorded as CR, which I believe stood for Capital Respite, which means his death sentence was commuted to transportation. Most of the other people recorded on this prison hulk list whose offence is recorded as CR also have um, transportation sentences of 14 years or life as well. So it suggests like a serious offence, but I can't find what John Goff was originally sentenced to death for. However, because he was a sailor, I wonder if it might have been for smuggling, which, which was considered uh, quite a serious offence. 
He was then transported on the ship Marquis of Wellington, which departed England on the 1st of September 1814. A detachment of the 46th Regiment were the guard on the ship and were led by Lieutenant Nunn. Uh, John Goff was about 23 years old on arrival to New South Wales on the 27th of January 1815. Uh, shortly after the ship arrived, the colonial secretary or maybe even the governor would have boarded the ship for muster to just check on the general well-being of the convicts, ensure, ensure like the voyage was okay and that they were in good health. Uh, the convicts were then disembarked on the 2nd of February and he was forwarded to Liverpool for distribution. He might have been assigned to Thomas Moore Esquire, as were five other men, although I'm not certain of this. Then on the 28th of June, 1815, he appeared on a list of prisoners bound for Newcastle by the ship Estramina, and again on the 22nd of October, um, again bound for Newcastle by the Estramina. Newcastle at this time was used as a place for recalcitrant convicts to work on the extraction of natural resources such as coal and timber. John absconded from his punishment in Newcastle again with a number of advertisements in the Sydney Gazette and New South Wales Advertiser listing him as a prisoner who absented himself from his work in Newcastle. Here is an example um, of one of them. The undermentioned prisoners having absented themselves from their respective employments and some of them at large with false certificates, all constables and others are hereby strictly required to use their utmost exertions in apprehending and lodging them in safe custody. He then appeared on the list for prisoners to be sent to Newcastle by the Lady Nelson on September 28, 1816. At Newcastle in March 1818, he received 25 lashes as punishment for refusing to work. Another man, Thomas Coyne, was also recorded as receiving 25 lashes for the same, and underneath their names was written, Two Notorious Offenders. He was then convicted on May 20th, 1820 in Sydney for an unknown offence, although I assume it would be related to absconding. Then on June 3rd, he appeared on a list of prisoners transported to Newcastle by the Lady Nelson, and then again on September 28th, and to return to his original sentence. So he was regularly absconding from Newcastle. He was then sent to Port Macquarie, which was further north, north of Newcastle in 1821. The town of Newcastle was expanding at this time with more and more free and ex-convict people settling there. This meant that Newcastle was becoming less and less isolated. So it was beginning to wind down its operation as a place of punishment with Port Macquarie becoming the place to send re-offenders for punishment in New South Wales. In December of 1821, he received punishment at Newcastle for the offence of refusing to do his government work. For this, he received 25 lashes. On the 14th of June 1822, the Sydney Gazette and New South Wales Advertiser reported a list of convicts who had absconded, and John Goff again appears here with a description that alludes to a previous violent experience. Described as being aged about 30 years with a black complexion, quote, has been shot in the mouth and lost all his front teeth. The newspaper obviously was not aware that John had been apprehended not long before it was printed because on June 13th he was incarcerated in Sydney. His offence was, quote, run from Port Macquarie. On the 31st of July he was discharged to the ship uh, Elizabeth Henrietta, which was bound for Hobart, and from Hobart he was forwarded to Macquarie Harbour, appearing on a record in March 1823, listing him among the convicts to be shipped to Macquarie Harbour to serve their sentences. Macquarie Harbour was another place of secondary punishment for convicts considered recalcitrant, and it became quite notorious during the years that it was in operation due to its isolation and brutality. While at Macquarie Harbour, Goff again absconded into the bush. He is then recorded as boarding the brig Mermaid on the 30th of March 1824, in which he is described as having run away from Macquarie Harbour and formerly at Port Macquarie. He was then transported back to New South Wales to Port Macquarie again. Back in New South Wales, it wasn't long before Goff continued with his previous rule-breaking. In December 1824, he was at Sydney's Hyde Park Barracks, waiting to be conveyed to Port Macquarie. He escaped this incarceration by removing bricks from a wall with four other convicts named Patrick McNamara, John George, Richard Winders and John Tepton. 
A newspaper report described Goff and McNamara as being of notorious character, and it's in this report that it said Goff had received upwards of 2,000 lashes since his arrival in the colony. Another report listing the men in their description described John Goff in further detail. Desperate character, upper lip shot away and otherwise disfigured by gunshot and other wounds about the neck and body, lately escaped from Macquarie Harbour, Van Diemen's Land. The constable who was on duty when the men escaped was also arrested under the suspicion of aiding and abetting their escape. Goff was apprehended again at some stage and sent to Port Macquarie where he was worked on the tobacco plantation. In Ian Duffield's journal article, The Life and Death of Black John Goff, Aspects of the Black Con Convict Contributions to Resistance Patterns During the Transportation Era in Eastern Australia, he talks a bit about how during the 1820s there was some experimentation with sugar and tobacco plantation production at Port Macquarie and how there has been debate about whether a slave mode of production was attempted using convict labour and that this cultivation produced working conditions that appeared similar to the West Indies. He also calls attention to the superintendent during this time, Thomas Ailoff Scott, and the previous experience he had with slave plantation production as he did study sugar cultivation and managed a plantation in Antigua. In June 1825, he absconded to the bush from the tobacco plantation, which was at the northwest of the river. He then proceeded to Rollins Plains, where he was then joined by two other prisoners who he, quote, had formed an arrangement with and who were of similar habits to himself. One anonymous individual reported to the Sydney Gazette and New South Wales Advertiser, the notorious Goff, one of the most incorrigible characters that ever infested society, ran into the bush. On the 2nd of June 1825, with Thomas Brooks and Joseph or John Banks, Goff broke in and robbed the home of Thomas Ailiff Scott. One record among the Colonial Secretary's papers from the 25th of July describes the incident. Forcibly entering a dwelling house and stealing therefrom public and private property and using other violence. And later in the Sydney Gazette and New South Wales Advertiser stated that the three men put Thomas Ailiff Scott and his servant James Schofield in bodily fear at Port Macquarie. Goff was also again described as a runaway from Macquarie Harbour. The day before the robbery by Goff and the other two men, another individual who was known as Captain Brown, who was also referred to as an infamous character, had um, interrupted a soldier and a constable between the prisoners' gardens and the plains and managed to take the musket from the soldier and tied the two men to a tree overnight. On Saturday morning, Goff with a party of eight men headed to an area known as Prospect, where they committed another robbery. However, most of the provisions that were believed to be of use to them had been removed in anticipation of another robbery. The main item that was stolen by the bushrangers was tobacco. Red Bank was apparently a rendezvous point for the bushrangers, and a civil officer and two soldiers proceeded there. Um, they enlisted some Aboriginal men to track Goff and his gang of bushrangers as well. And they soon came upon Captain Brown, and Brown was shot as he attempted to flee, and two other men he was with were taken into custody. The next day, another group consisting of four constables and the superintendent were sent to Red Bank as well to pursue the detestable Goff and his gang. That night, a, um, a man named Captain Gilman went up the northwest arm of the river and planted a party of soldiers at Prospect, and the following day he scoured the bush, sometimes by himself and sometimes with some soldiers. On the Wednesday, almost a week after the initial robbery, Goff and some of his gang were attacked by a soldier and a constable near Prospect. Two of the men were arrested and another one was wounded. And soon after, two others had surrendered when the superintendent came upon them with the assistance of Aboriginal trackers after hearing two shots. Goff and another man fled. They were yelled out to stop twice and they continued to run. The other man was shot and killed. Goff soon gave himself up along with the remainder of his gang, which was said to number 22 men. They were apprehended and held in jail in Sydney for trial, as he is recorded in an 1825 muster list. On December 2nd, Goff, Brooks and Banks were found guilty, and on the morning of December 7th, they were sentenced to death. But Goff was soon reprieved and he was sent to Norfolk Island for life, which was yet another settlement for secondary punishment. 
Norfolk Island was closed in the early 1800s, then reopened in 1825 for reoffending and violent male convicts. Over this phase of operation as a place of punishment, it gained a reputation as one of, if not the most brutal settlements in Australia. It is also it is also quite isolated as a small island located in the Pacific Ocean, about 1,600 kilometres northeast of Sydney and 1,100 kilometres northwest of Auckland in New Zealand. During John Goff's incarceration at Norfolk Island, Captain Vance Young Donaldson was the commandant. On September 25, 1826, Goff led an uprising. It was the first on Norfolk Island and it was in collaboration with William Moore and Edward Watson. Now, there are, mul there are multiple different accounts of what happened. As Ian Duffield stated, there were two newspaper reports, a dispatch gov Governor Darling sent to London, one by Reverend Thomas Sharp and one written by a convict John Lynch on behalf of Gough, Watson and Moore. So it's a bit difficult to know the truth of what happened and which account to draw from, but I'm going to take bits and pieces from all of them. So the Reverend Sharp describes Goff as having misled and deceived his fellow convicts with the story that there was a territory 100 miles north that was frequented by American ships and by doing this Goff would leave the majority of the convicts at Phillip Island and take with him and his close associates the stores and ships for a voyage to New Zealand. However, the convict Lynch claimed that the uprising was planned over three months and that starvation rations are what provoked the convicts to rebellion. Because despite there being an abundance of fruit, vegetables and livestock on the island, the convicts would be punished if they just approached them. According to Lynch, two convicts had taken to the bush and soldiers were ordered out to locate them. When it was noticed in the, on the morning of the 25th, there were only 20 soldiers left in the garrison, the convicts commenced the attack. Prisoners who were believed to be suspicious or untrustworthy were confined to a hut with someone guarding them. The three men proceeded to the town guard and confined the soldiers there and took their weapons. They moved on to the civil officer's hut where they said they found six pistols and two muskets and confined the civil officers in the jail. The men said they then held counsel to discuss whether they should proceed to the garrison or wait for the commandant to come for inspection. They said they had agreed to wait for the commandant to arrive but while they waited they noticed four soldiers heading towards the hospital so the four men went to make these soldiers their prisoners. In a newspaper report um, that was discussing the evidence presented at the later trial, it stated that on the morning of September 25th, Sergeant Boyle of the 59th Regiment, along with Corporal Wilson and two other soldiers named Eustead and Jackson, they, they were ordered to head to the hospital. Along the way, the Sergeant Boyle stopped to fix the lace of his boot and the others proceeded ahead without him, and followed after them once he finished fixing his boot. As they approached the hospital, they noticed four convicts who were standing close to some ruins that were by the hospital. And when they arrived at the hospital, the soldiers asked for the doctor, who wasn't there. They then heard a noise from behind them, and when they turned around, they saw the convicts, armed with knives, pistols, and a bayonet, rush them and cried out, Stand you buggers, or we'll blow your brains out. Edward Watson then discharged his pistol at Corporal Wilson, who fell. Watson yelled, I have done for one bugger, and went up to Sergeant Boyle and said, And you, you bugger, ought to have been the first, and attempted to discharge his pistol at him, but it failed. Moore then drove a bayonet through the body of Corporal Wilson, who was lying on the ground. Lynch, writing on behalf of Gough, Moore and Watson, presented this killing as an accident. The other convict named Weaver came up to Sergeant Boyle with a knife and threatened to drive it into his heart if he made a stir, then took him prisoner and to the jail where the Sydney Gazette and New South Wales advertiser stated it appeared to already be under a state of general mutiny. It was stated that Goff attacked Private Eustead, attempting to shoot him in the face, but Eustead had tried to run and the ball from the gun only grazed his lip. Goff then pursued him and hit him over the head a number of times with the pistol then secured him and took him to the jail as well. An alarm was sounded to alert of the convict mutiny and the soldiers were said to have surrounded the jail. Sergeant Boyle and the two other soldiers were released after about an hour of confinement. Sharp and Darling's account describes the convict rebels failing to seize the island settlement and retreated under fire to its only landing beach, where, according to Lynch's account, they embarked on three boats with weapons and stores. 
They went to Phillip Island, which is just south of the main Norfolk Island settlement. And at Phillip Island, the skilled convict tradesmen were said to begin making masts, possibly to prepare for a longer voyage elsewhere. The next day, the commandant had Phillip Island raided by a party of soldiers. In Sharp's account, the convicts were caught by surprise and 21 of them were apprehended, while one was shot dead and another drowned. Lynch's account confirms that two convicts died, but denied that the convicts were drunk when the soldiers raided. He said that some convicts preferred to drown than be captured, and a man, Thomas Lynch, leaped into the water with a musket in hand, and another man, another man named Loomis also leaped into the water and was shot. Lynch asserted that there were lookouts who were carefully posted who reported the approach of the soldiers, and the convicts contested their landing but were just short of ammunition. Some of the convicts escaped this by fleeing to the main peak of the island, and Sharp claimed that Goff was among them, although Goff may have also been wounded at some stage as well. Commandant Donaldson had all the boats removed from the island, so the remaining convicts were stranded. In Lynch's account, Goff and some of the remaining men were captured two weeks later, while Sharp claimed that Goff was captured in the third attack after putting up, quote, desperate resistance. Reverend Sharp claimed only five men escaped, however, in Governor Darling's dispatch to London, it is stated that 50 out of 115 men escaped the island by boat. According to Lynch's account, it was a collective movement, but Ian Duffield also pointed out that while some level of agreement among convicts would have been necessary, Lynch would be unlikely to highlight the leadership role of men who are facing a death sentence. Lynch also brought up the convict John Weavers, who he said was very sick at the time he was captured. Weavers was taken to the hospital where he soon died, or gave up the ghost, as Lynch wrote. He said that just before Weavers died, he had expressed his wish that God would prolong his life so that he could die with his fellow prisoners, Goff, Moore and Watson. In Sydney on the 21st of September 1827, John Goff, William Moore and Edward Watson were indicted for the willful murder of Corporal Robert Wilson of the 57th Regiment of Foot at Norfolk Island on the 25th of September 1826. The first count was against Edward Watson as being principal in the murder by discharging a pistol at Corporal Wilson, with Goff and Moore for second degree murder by aiding and abetting. The second count was against William Moore as principal in the murder by the stab of a bayonet, with Goff and Watson as principal in the second degree, aiding and abetting. Evidence was presented to the court and afterwards John Goff attempted to defend himself. He, quote, entered into a lengthy detail of alleged hardships he had suffered on Norfolk Island and stated that the convict's rebellion was in order to gain their liberty, not to murder, and denied having played any part in the death of the Corporal Wilson. Moore and Watson did not offer a defence, and the jury found the three men guilty. The Chief Justice then thought it necessary to express his opinion on Goff's statement. You, John Goff, have detailed to the court a long complaint of the hardships you have undergone, of your love of liberty, and of the degree of violence which you thought yourself justified in using to obtain it. By your own statement, your whole life has been one career of crime. You have declared that you have been in every penal settlement in the colony, and the inference naturally to be drawn from such a fact is that your offences have been of that nature which render you unfit for any other situation. It is within the recollection of this court how near you were at no distant period to have, you, to have been consigned to the grave, and happy would it have been for you had your career then terminated without the additional crime of the blood of a fellow creature being added to the list. Whatever hardships you might have had to complain of, and you should not forget that they were the consequences of your own act, how could they have affected the present charge against you, or in what way were they connected with the individuals whom you assailed, when, perhaps induced by disease or some other cause, they were proceeding to the hospital, unsuspicious of your, of your purpose, and the life of one of whom you took away. With respect to the general harsh treatment of which you complain on Norfolk Island, what are men sent there for? It is within the knowledge of the court that they are never sent except for crimes of the deepest dye, and it is then to be supposed that they are sent there to be indulged, to be fed with the fruits of the earth, and that, and that they are not to work in chains. No, the object in sending men there is not only as a punishment for their past crimes, but to serve as a terror to others, and so far from it being a reproach, as you have stated, 
It is a wise project of the government in instituting that settlement for the punishment of the twice and thrice convicted felon as a place of terror to evildoers and in order to repress the mass of crime which, with which the colony unhappily abounds. Goff, Watson and Moore were then set to be executed on Monday the 24th of September 1827, almost exactly one year after the uprising. On the Monday the 24th, a crowd gathered to witness the execution. A few minutes past nine o'clock in the morning, the three men, Goff, Watson and Moore, were led from the condemned cells into the execution yard. Goff was led by the Catholic Reverend Terry and Watson and Moore were led by the Anglican Reverends Cooper and Hines. John Goff kneeled down and kissed his coffin. He then, with a prayer book in his hand, joined in fervent devotion, frequently sighing as if in regret for his past errors. At about half past nine o'clock, the three men ascended the drop. Again, they kneeled down and engaged in prayer. Goff leaned his head on the shoulder of Father Terry. Goff then spoke to the crowd. According to the newspaper reports from the Gleaner and the Sydney Gazette and New South Wales Advertiser, Goff spoke in a firm and distinct tone of voice as he acknowledged the justice of his sentence and warned others to take warning from his fate. He then, quote, thanked the Almighty that he had then to suffer as time had been allowed him for repentance and he trusted that he had made his peace with God. Goff kissed the rope and after their prayers and after Goff spoke to the crowd, the three men embraced each other. They then took their spots and had the ropes adjusted around their necks and awaited their fate. Goff was said to be uttering prayers for mercy. As he uttered these final prayers for mercy, the drop fell and... In a few seconds, the unfortunate men ceased to exist. The bodies were then handed over for medical dissection. Death masks were made, and a comment about Goff was made, saying, quote, His skull is said to present a fine subject for the observations of the phrenologist. Ian Duffield pointed out that Norfolk Island remained disturbed after the uprising and after Goff, Watson and Moore were executed. In October 1827, a man who was involved in the 1826 uprising, Patrick Clinch, escaped confinement and made an attempt on the life of the new commandant, Captain Orman. Clinch had actually been in jail with Goff in 1825 in Sydney, both awaiting trials on the same day for separate crimes. Like Goff, Clinch was sentenced to death, then reprieved and sent to Norfolk Island. A few days after making an attempt on the commandant's life, he was shot dead by a patrol. I guess the reason I chose this topic to talk about is because a lot of things get forgotten in history. Initially, I just wanted to do something about John Caesar because he was the first bush ranger and I hadn't heard of him before I really started looking into Australian history. Convicts and bush rangers were a big part of Australian history and the folklore that developed here. And people have been really fascinated by bush rangers and some became quite romanticised, so... They have been depicted in Australian media a lot, but these depictions often focused on a handful of people when there really were so many bushrangers. And not only that, but I don't recall ever hearing much about rebellions and uprisings and riots that happened besides Eureka, so that's why I wanted to talk about John Goff as well. And like I said, things in history can get forgotten, and when we think of Australian colonial history, we tend to think that it was pretty much all British and Irish people and Aboriginal people. Not everyone is aware that there were African people here during that time period, so I think it's important to acknowledge this. And I would also argue that, although they may not have been a significantly large population, they did contribute to the history and development of Australia and did contribute to the folklore as well. And also, when talking about some of the African convicts and even the free African people who came to Australia... Not all of them were bushrangers and leading rebellions, of course. Many of them did live regular lives, settled down, have families. But yeah, I just think there's so many interesting stories in history that we don't often hear about. And obviously it's the big events that get the attention and the lives of people involved can often be overlooked, which I understand. But I also think it's a shame as well because the individual stories are what I have found so captivating since I got into Australian history. So yeah, um, I'll hopefully have more to come sooner rather than later. And I hope it was interesting. Thank you for watching.